Hello, I'm Lewis Kaufman, and I'm about to give a talk. This talk is about rotational virtual knots and links, parity bracket polynomials, and quantum link invariance. It is based partly on the paper indicated on this slide, which was published a few years ago in the Journal of Knot Theory and its Ramifications. We begin by reviewing uh, about virtual knots, and then I will explain what rotational virtual knots are. Virtual knots are obtained from classical diagrammatic knot theory by adding one extra kind of crossing called the virtual crossing, which you see indicated here on this slide as two lines crossing transversely to one another with a little circle drawn around them. It's a crossing, but it's neither over nor under, and it actually indicates a connection uh, between two points and is not meant to be a crossing in the sense of embeddings in three space. Um, in fact, as we shall see, uh, it can be thought of as a detour along a handle on a surface, or it can be simply thought of as a diagrammatic detour, drawing something which cannot otherwise be drawn in the plane. Moves are added to the usual Reitermeister moves to handle this virtual knot theory diagrammatically, and the moves consist in the ones that you see on the right-hand part of this slide. A a projected one-dimensional, uh, projected one move, which is a little curl that can be removed or added, a two move, which consists of crossing through an arc and then crossing back through that arc, and a three move, which changes the triangle. And uh, these are just like the Rennemeister moves, except there are no crossing restrictions because these three moves are entirely among virtual crossings. And then one more important uh, virtual move, which consists in two consecutive virtual crossings going across on a form that looks like a Reitermeister three move. And there's a real crossing, a classical crossing below them, and they can be transferred below. So this is as though you were to take the arc consisting of the two virtual crossings, cut it out, and redraw it beneath. And in fact, that's an example of what I call a detour move illustrated in the bottom of the slide, where anywhere in the diagram you have some collection of consecutive virtual crossings. You're allowed to cut that arc out and reconnect it anywhere else, putting virtual crossings wherever it meets the diagram. So this emphasizes that the virtual crossings are actually places of connection between two points. And as you see, if you think about it a little bit, you can obtain any detour move of the kind that I've indicated by a series of small detour move applications where the small detour moves or the so-called virtual moves are on the right-hand side. So this is the diagrammatic definition of virtual knob theory. There are some moves which you should be warned are not allowed. Um, you're not allowed what looks like a Rademeister three move where a classical arc goes across a virtual crossing, under or over. If you add only one of them, you get an interesting theory. Usually we add over and not under, and that's called welded knot theory and goes back to Rourke, Fenn, and Rimiani. On the other hand, if you add both of them, then Sam Nelson and the Kamatas a long time ago proved that that would unknot knots. Now, rotational virtual knot theory is special in that we do not allow the first virtual move. That is, a little virtual curl is not allowed to be undone. And that means that pictures that you see, like the ones on this slide, K, L, and L prime, all turn out to be non-trivial rotational virtual knots. 
K would be trivial if you could undo that little curl because then you could pull in by a Rademacher 2 move and then remove another curl and you'd have an unknot diagram. Um, the uh, way to think about rotational virtual knot theory is that the detour move is now restricted to regular homotopy in the plane or on the two sphere instead of just any replacement. Um, that's one way to think about it. And another is to use the list of virtual moves as we've indicated them on this slide, but eliminate the virtual R1. You're allowed virtual R2, virtual R3, and the mixed. However you care to think about it, it turns out that all quantum link invariants, and we'll talk about them in a little bit, extend to invariants of rotational virtual links. And in that sense, rotational virtuals are the correct domain for studying quantum link invariants if you want to understand uh, a topological domain where one can test them uh, to their fullest extent. Now, in this slide, I have indicated some things about regular homotopy. It is a fact that using the Whitney trick, you can produce curls of opposite type that cancel each other out or can be produced by using only the two move and the three move. And so some curls can be removed in the uh, rotational theory, even though uh, not all can be. And you can see some irreducible specimens with curls in them uh, at the bottom of the page. And these are distinguished by the total turn of the tangent vector, the Whitney degree. Uh, another aspect of rotational uh, virtual knot theory, which I won't talk about here, is cobordism of rotational virtual knots. And uh, I'm just giving you an example here. Here is the, uh, what I call the virtual stevedores knot over there on the left. And I wish to go through an oriented saddle point. And in order to do that, I usually, in doing a cobordism of that kind, would put in a curl, and it would be allowed to put in or take out a curl. Here, I can use the Whitney trick and put in a pair of canceling curls, as you see. And now I have the curl at which I wish to do my saddle point, and I do the saddle point. And then, if you look at the resulting link carefully, you will see that it consists in two components. And one of them has a long uh, consecutive sequence of virtual crossings going from the bottom right all the way up to the top. And if you were to cut that out and uh, or look at it carefully, remember, because in virtual rotational knot theory, you have to do a regular homotopy of it. So you do a regular homotopy, and that's what's indicated in the middle line. And then it turns out that after doing the regular homotopy, which I hope is visible to you, um, you then see a uh, virtual two-move detour collapse, and you end up with a classical link of two components, which has unknotted components and unlinked components, and they can slide apart from one another and go through deaths. And that gives us a picture of a uh, movement through saddle points and, and uh, deaths that creates a disk that this knot bounds in virtual four space. That's just a taste of rotational virtual knot cobordism. Uh, an interesting topic, just to give you a feel for virtual rotational knot theory. And let's go on. Um, an important way to think about virtual knots, rotational or otherwise, is the use of abstract diagrams and surfaces, also Gauss codes. Um, I've illustrated all of those matters on this slide. On the left, I have a virtual trefoil knot. It has one virtual crossing and two reels. And I have shown uh, a way of producing a ribbon surface on which the knot is embedded, if you think of the surface as surface cross I, or has a diagram drawn on it with no virtual crossings. I will refer to diagrams on a surface from now on if I speak of this. So you see what we did. We formed a neighborhood uh, of each classical crossing. We placed each class classical crossing in a disk. We 
took the arcs of the diagram and put them in the cores of ribbons that are connecting these disks. And when we went through a virtual crossing, we just continue on a ribbon. And if there is another line going through that crossing, it continues on an independent ribbon. The ribbons are seen to go over and under one another in the pictures, but in fact, we're thinking of an abstract surface, so it doesn't matter which way it's drawn, over or under. Um, that gives you the ribbon surface, the abstract link diagram in that surface, and that surface has some boundaries, and if you fill in the boundaries with disks, then you get a least genus surface for that diagram on which the virtual knot is now realized as a diagram in that surface, as a knot in the thickened surface. So virtual diagrams can be regarded as representing knots in thickened surfaces. And then you can go back through the moves and see what it is about the knots on surfaces that's being preserved by the moves. And when you think about that a little bit, you will realize that the surface genus can change. And in fact, one way of understanding how that comes about is to go up to a knot in a surface and form a neighborhood of that knot in the surface, as I'm indicating on this slide. Here's a knot in the surface, and I form a neighborhood of the same kind in the surface, and then I cut out that neighborhood, N of K, and I throw away the rest of the surface. Now you realize that if we do that, we may throw away genus, which is out beyond the neighborhood. In this case, we didn't throw away any extra genus, but it's quite possible that we would do that. You, so you cut it out. Uh, you can then do two things. You could put it in another surface by adding some surfaces to the boundary of it, and that would put it in some other genus. Uh, or um, you can arrange it by, um, by normalizing it, getting rid of any curls in it, since it's an abstract surface, so that it's normal always points upward and it can be projected into the plane and it becomes a virtual diagram in the plane. So if you think on this situation carefully, you find that the diagrammatic theory of the virtual knots and links is equivalent to knots in thickened surfaces taken up to handle stabilization, which is what I meant by throwing away or adding the extra handles. You can also think of this as the equivalence relation that's generated by this scoop and re-embed, where you scoop out the knot by taking a neighborhood of it, and then you're allowed to re-embed it in another surface. So in this way, the virtual knot theory becomes equivalent to a theory of certain knots in some very simple three-manifolds stabilized. The, the class of three-manifolds are surfaces, orientable surfaces across the unit interval. And the virtual knot theory is a theory of knots in those three manifolds. In other words, the virtual knot theory is a step in the direction of doing a direct combinatorial formulation for knots in three manifolds. We would like to extend further, but we are staying here for the moment, and we're actually in this talk going off in a somewhat different direction by taking the extra restriction of rotational. Now, when you take rotational, you see what happens to the abstract surfaces. Here is a nice rotational knot, K prime. And if you form its neighborhood, you see that the ribbon has a little curl in it. And now, suppose you took that curl seriously. Uh, well, then you would, um, you would uh, not be allowed to remove it on the abstract surface, and then uh, you would have an equivalence relation on the abstract surfaces that you could write down that was equivalent to our equivalence relation on rotational virtual knots. I won't go into surfaces in any detail here. I'm just going to point out that we can think about the, ro the rotationals as living on special surfaces if we want to. So the rotational virtual knot theory is a theory of knots in oriented ribbon surfaces, abstract link diagrams, with twisting allowed in the bands of the surface. This twisting is indexed by the virtual crossing structure in the rotational diagram. Now, 
we're going to work diagrammatically from now on. And one has the bracket polynomial model for the Jones polynomial and its generalizations here for rotational virtuals. You do it the same way you do the ordinary bracket. You take the skein expansion using A and A inverse, which makes sure, which begins to make sure of invariance under Reitermeister 2 and Reitermeister 3. If you have an extra loop, you multiply by minus A squared minus A to the minus 2. And if you have some curls of a classical type, they it follows from those two rules that it multiplies by minus A cubed and minus A to the minus 3. I often call B A inverse. And I often write D for minus A squared minus A to the minus 2. Now, what do you do for virtuals? Well, you do the same thing for virtuals. All the loops with virtual crossings are just assigned to D. But for rotational virtuals, we watch those loops and take their regular homotopy class. And when you do that, you see from our definitions that that will be an invariant. It will be an invariant where you will get polynomial, Laurent polynomial coefficients multiplying regular homotopy classes of certain loops. Let's look at an example. Here is this specimen, um, this K, uh, with a couple of virtual crossings and a couple of classical crossings. And I have indicated the four states of the bracket. Smooth, both crossings in the A way, smooth one A and the other B, one B, the other A, and both Bs. Now we have to, and now we know that therefore the bracket polynomial is going to be A squared times the homotopy class of that loop, AB times the homotopy class of that loop, BA times the homotopy class of that loop, and B squared times the homotopy class of the remaining loop. But what do we get? Let's see. Now here, um, I'm going to give every loop its due, so just for the sake of cataloging. So this first loop is regularly homotopic to a, a classical loop. It's just a circle. You can just do a Reinemeister 2 move on the loop, and it simplifies. So that one gets a D. The next one to the right on the top, as a canceling pair of curls. So by the Whitney trick, it just gets a D. The next one is AB times two guys with Whitney degree zero, not one, not minus one. We're only looking at the absolute value of the Whitney degree here for simplicity. And so those are non-trivial. And you see a term in the summary, AB times a product of two new variables indicated by diagrams, these two little graphs, they're non-trivial. And then the last one is also a, a standard loop. So the bracket polynomial is a squared plus b squared plus ab times d plus ab times these two loops. Uh, and in this case, you see that the unknotted single loop gets d in this version of the bracket. So we have proved that this uh, character up here, this k, is a non-trivial virtual knot. Because if it were equivalent to just a simple circle, why then uh, it would have a d for its answer. And it certainly doesn't. And so that's an example of proving that something is a non-trivial rotational virtual knot. Here's another example. Um, at the top of the slide, I've worked out what happens if you have two twists in a row. It multiplies by something. Uh, and you can figure out the answer. And there's the answer in the box. That's for the bracket in any case. If you have a double twist, then it's a squared times a horizontal smoothing plus 2ab plus b squared d times a vertical smoothing. And then apply that to this culprit over here, which is that twist with a couple of um, virtual curls at its ends. And you see that what happens is that when you smooth it one way, you get something trivial. But when you smooth it the other way, you get a couple of these zero Whitney degree bits. And so this is a non-trivial virtual knot. Um, another example of this is given below, where I have taken, in this case, a knot 
which has trivial Jones polynomial, and it will have basically a trivial bracket polynomial as well, but viewed as a rotational virtual, it's non-trivial. The curling and Whitney degree aspects of the of the expansion are detected in the course of working out the bracket. Now we come to a series of examples, and I'm just showing you some uh, phenomena here. Here's a nice link which consists of a, of a um, of a of a loop with uh, with two curls on it, uh, and then it's undercrossed by a circle, and it has a non-trivial bracket. It's detected by the bracket. Here's another one where each of them has two curls, and, uh, and that one's detected by the bracket. That's L2. On the other hand, here's L3. One of them has two curls, the other has only one. And when you calculate the bracket, it comes out equal to uh, D times uh, a, little, um, a little Whitney degree zero bit. But, uh, but that isn't actually detecting a difference between this and an unlinked pair. So, so I would say L3 is not yet detected by the bracket. And here's L4, which is another configuration of two, two curls, two curls. It's not detected by the bracket. So we're going to see that we need more invariance than just the bracket to detect some of these. And for that purpose, I bring up the subject of parity. Now, virtual diagrams have parity that is not seen in classical diagrams. The parity is of, it occurs when you take a walk on the diagram, say from crossing number one there, and count how many times you go through classical crossings before you return to one. So you see that in this diagram, as you walk from one, you meet two, then you go through a virtual crossing, I'm not counting it, and come back to one. So the answer to the question, how many crossings did you go through, is one. If you write a Gauss code, you just keep track of the trip. One to two to one, and then to two, and then back to one. One to one two, the bare Gauss code without any crossing information. And you see that in between the two appearances of one, there's one two. And in between the two appearances of two, there's one one. So Two is an odd crossing, and one is an odd crossing. A crossing is odd if it flanks an odd number of symbols in the Gauss code. One can define the odd ride of the knot to be equal to the sum of the signs of the odd crossings, where the signs in this particular knot happen to be negative. Uh, and I'll leave it to you to understand then that if I switch the crossing, the sign would be positive and that that corresponds to a kind of right-hand rule mnemonic if you want to remember signs. Now, what you can prove about this odd writhe, some of the signs of the odd crossings, is that it's invariant under the virtual isotopy. It's going to be zero if the knot is classical because classical knots don't exhibit any parity. And uh, if you apply it to the mirror image of the knot where you switch all the crossings, you get the negative. So that means that we have proved by our little calculation that shows that j of this knot k is minus two, we have proved that this is a chiral virtual knot. We don't have to think about rotationals yet. This is an example of proving something about a virtual knot. It's chiral, can't be equivalent to a classical knot. So that's the parity phenomenon. And now we come to a very beautiful way to use the bracket in relation to parity. Uh, first, I'll explain how we do it for ordinary virtual knots and then how it generalizes to rotationals. And first, just for knots, uh, then for links. So if you have a knot diagram, you have a definite index of whether a crossing is even or odd. We'll come to links in a moment. And if it's an even crossing, you're going to do an expansion of the bracket. But if it's an odd crossing, you're going to notify it. You're going to turn it into a, a four-valent node. And you do that first. You process the diagram by notifying all the odd crossings. And now you have a graph, and you expand that graph on the remaining crossings. And you will get a sum of 
Laurent polynomials multiplied by some graphs. And then you will reduce those graphs by applying Reitermeister two type reductions of the kind indicated at the bottom of the page. This is algorithmic. You're not talking about increasing the complexity of these diagrams. You simply search them for the possibility of doing Reitermeister two moves and undo them if, undo those moves if you can until you get a reduced graphical diagram. If your diagram, if your graphical diagram is irreducible, it becomes part of the invariant. That's the algorithm for the Monturov bracket polynomial, parity bracket. And you'll, you can have a good time proving that this is an invariant. Here's a simple example of it. This Kishino diagram has all odd crossings, as you can easily check. And it turns out that the Kishino diagram has trivial bracket polynomial, and many other uh, invariants are unable to see it. So for a while, it was an interesting game to try to prove the Kishino is non-trivial by one method or another. The parity bracket does it at once with no trouble. You see all the crossings are odd, so you notify all of them, and then you examine this graph and you see that there are no two move reductions. And so we're done. There it is, that's the invariant. The diagram of the thing itself is its own invariant in that sense. Uh, so that's an example of using parity in a strong way by using the parity bracket polynomial. Um, you can find the genus of some knots, the least genus on which the virtual knot will sit, by examining the least genus on which the corresponding graph will sit. So here's another example. Every crossing in this virtual knot is odd. Uh, and so we notify the whole thing and we discover that there aren't any two moves. And so we're done. Uh, and we can calculate that genus if we wish. Uh, many examples of this kind. Here's our first rotational example. Everything works for rotationals, and you have to keep track of the fact that uh, you are going to look at the regular homotopy class of the curves in the graph. So in this case, all four of those crossings are odd. You notify, and then you realize that that extra curl is obstructing a possible Reitermeister two move. It can't be done because of the extra curl. And so this diagram is locked up. It's reducible, and and so we know that this knot is a non-trivial one. Uh, and in fact, we can add virtual cross, we can add virtual curls in appropriate places to obstruct Reitermeister two reductions and get an irreducibility theorem. For every virtual diagram K with all odd crossings, there exists a decoration by virtual curls to form a new diagram L where the graph obtained by replacing all the odd crossings in L by nodes is irreducible, proving that L is non-trivial. So this is an example. Here's a rather trivial virtual knot, but we put in some curls and we get a non-trivial rotational virtual knot and provable by using the parity bracket polynomial because those crossings are all odd. Many examples of this kind. So now the parity bracket can be extended to links. And this is important because we're going to use the parity bracket to detect those links that I showed you a little while ago that we couldn't detect with the ordinary bracket. This requires an extension of the notion of crossing that is selected for notification. I and R and Kastner do this by making all the crossings between link cro components selected. That is to say, we're going to have a new kind of special crossing, which is made into a node, and that's a link crossing. Um, and then we have to have a wider choice of reduction relations. You can find the details of this and more about parity in the paper indicated here that was also published in the JKTR. Um, so here's what we're going to do. If the crossing is odd, we notify it with a black node. If the crossing is a between two link components, we also notify it 
and here we do it by a box. And if the crossing is even and between a component and itself, then we can expand the bracket on the remainder. Now, once you have done this, having two types of graphical nodes, then you have to analyze invariants and you find, yes, I shall have Reitermeister two reductions for both of these types of graphical node. And you will also have to allow graphical equivalences among those nodes in partly the usual way, that is, virtual crossings detour across graphical nodes. They always did and they always will. Those are the bottom two equations on the right. But three link type nodes can undergo a Reitermeister flat move if they wish. And two link type nodes can go across a uh, regular node, an odd node. So these are the full rules for the graphs. And then you have to take a reduced version of the graph or an equivalence class of the graph up to this. Uh, this makes for an interesting invariant to investigate and we made some steps in our paper and more can be done with this invariant. However, in the case that I'm going to use, I don't have any crossings that are self crossings in my examples. So I'm just going to use a single node and then everything behaves as before, except that all link crossings become notified. So here's how it goes. Here's L1. I notify both of those. And then I examine it and I see that it's re irreducible. And I look at L2 and I notify both of those and it's irreducible. And I look at L3 and I notify both of those and it's irreducible. It seems a little silly, doesn't it? And finally L4. And, and so all of those are irreducible. Every single one of them is irreducible. And immediately so by this extension of the parity bracket polynomial. We only needed one node type because we have no self-crossing in this situation. So by using this combinatorial argument, we have been able to detect all of them uh, going beyond the bracket. And now you might wonder, well, maybe you could use more classical invariants or quantum invariants to detect all of them, could you? So we're going to investigate that in the last part of this talk and talk about what is a quantum invariant of a rotational knot. So, so far, the combinatorial topology using parity can show that many rotational virtual links are undetectable by the bracket, that are undetectable by the bracket polynomial are non-trivial and distinct. And we're asking, what about quantum invariants for further detection? To do quantum invariants, we need the tangle category, which is a category that will produce diagrams that are arranged nicely with respect to a vertical. And I have indicated here the moves in the tangle category. Um, for regular isotopy of knots. So we're not worrying about the curl move. And on the other hand, we since we're arranging things like with respect to a Morse uh, height function, we have critical points and we have to cancel maxima with minima along arcs. Um, we don't have any other kinds of critical points except crossings and maxima and minima. And so, we have the standard Reitermeister two move in a vertical form. We have the standard Reitermeister three move in a vertical form. And we have number four, we have swing moves, which interchange a crossing across a maximum to another crossing of the opposite kind with respect to a vertical. And also doing it for a minimum as well. These are the moves that you need to do the Morse tangle category. And with the Morse tangle category, you can assign a partition function, which can be an invariant of a knot, by taking a matrix with four indices for each crossing and another matrix for the inverse crossing and matrices with two indices for the cups and the caps for the maxima and the minima. And then you label the diagram with a sufficient number of indices so that you can contract everything.
meaning you sum over the repeated indices and you get a partition function. And that partition function can be a link invariant if the R satisfies the Yang-Baxter equation and the M satisfies certain relationships with the R. To extend, this is basically a very uh, quick description of what is a quantum invariant of links. It can be made oriented and then you have the full story. I'll stay unoriented here. To add this and make it an invariant of rotational virtuals, you simply put in the crossed identity map for the virtual crossing. That is, the tensor that you put in for the cross for the virtual crossing insists that the ends of the of the diagonal lines are both the same in both directions. So it will be one when that is true and zero otherwise. It's an identity crossed identity matrix. And if you just simply put that in, and if the R's and the M's satisfied the original equations, Yang Baxter and, and swing move <coughs> um, equations for the R's and the M's, and the M's will cancel each other maxima and minima correctly, then the new one will be an invariant of rotational virtuals. So all quantum link invariants extend to invariants of rotational virtuals is the statement that I have just explained to you in this concrete way. What are the equations, the tensor equations? Well, here they are. We're going to have that the virtual crossing gets the deltas, as I said. Um, you need that an M combined, an M with upper indices combined with an M with lower indices along one index gives you the identity. That's the, that's the zeroth move. The second move tells you that the R's are inver and the R inverses go to identity. The third move tells you what happens when you write down the concatenation of R's for a left version of the Rademeister 3 move and compare it with the right version. And the fourth move tells you what happens to the R and the R bar and the M when you plug them together along a swing move. Now, I won't go into the details of that, but the point about, about rotational virtuals is this. The M may not be symmetric, but when you put in a virtual crossing, that will switch and give you the transpose of the M matrix that you were just looking at. And that's one of the reasons why you cannot just ignore that. Um, uh, and so there will be an M contribution from uh, a, fir a, a flat virtual curl. Uh, if the M is non-trivial, then the twisted M that you get by putting in a flat uh, crossing there will also be non-trivial and it will contribute to the invariant. But as long as we don't throw away those virtual curls, everything else will carry its invariance forward into the extended invariant. We can make, of course, a rotational virtual tangle category by adding all the rules uh, for dealing with this, including the virtual rules. And given any diagram, you can decompose it into an appropriate collection of cups and caps by setting it up with respect to a, more, a Morse height function so that in every horizontal sector, you either see a minimum, a maximum, a virtual crossing or a classical crossing. And then it can be put together into the partition function. But now, I'm going to talk about a class of quantum link invariants that work by a functor from the tangle category to the category of a quantum algebra. A quantum algebra is an algebra that generalizes some of the properties of a Hopf algebra, and Hopf algebras are quantum algebras. So there's going to be an algebra, and what's going to happen is that there will be in the category for the quantum algebra, there will, be, there will be bits of algebra on the lines. And those will be little blobs. And we will multiply the algebra upward along the lines. So if you see a line with an A and a B in it, like in the middle of this slide, that's the same as a blob labeled AB 
And if you have two blobs next to one another, then that's the tensor product of A and B and corresponds to the algebra tensored with itself. Uh, if, you, if in the tensor product you have the virtual crossing, that corresponds to a permutation. And that virtual crossing lives in the category of the algebra that way, and it comes from the tangle category in that way. You have cups and caps, and the cups and caps are postulated to satisfy the following relation that if you move a, a bead, uh, if you remove an algebra element over the top to the going counterclockwise uh, over, the, over a maximum, it turns into the antipode applied to A. I have to say a word about the antipode. And if you move it counterclockwise along a minimum, it turns into the antipode applied to A. That you see on the bottom of the slide. The antipode is a mapping of the algebra to itself, which reverses the order of multiplication, an antimorphism of the algebra with itself. Um, I want to indicate that by uh, showing you something here. Um, in the middle of this slide, I have somebody, in the very middle of the slide, I have x times y. And now going to the right, I bring y up over the top and it becomes s of y. And then I bring s over x over the top and becomes s of x. But they have to come over in that order so that now reading upward along the line on the left, you see s of y first and then s of x, which is interpreted as s of y times s of x. And the maximum and the minimum that you're looking at, since they have no algebra on them, cancel. And so now going all the way over to the left, I say that S of something can be obtained by putting it in the middle of a max min like that. Try it. You put something X, Y in the middle of the max min. Um, and then you go through our motions. It's, y, it's X times Y and pull them around and over. And you see it comes out S of Y times S of X. So we have s of x, y is s of y times s of x. The antipode, the idea of having an antipode fits naturally into the idea of diagramming a category for such an algebra um, with these properties. Now, uh, another property of, of the quantum algebra and its category is that the quantum algebra contains a solution to the Yang-Baxter equation, a solution to the braiding equation. But um, in the algebraic form, that solution is called a solution to the algebraic Yang-Baxter equation. It isn't satisfying exactly the same relations. We'll see what happens. But it has an inverse in the algebra. And the inverse in the tensor product is given by this diagram. E, E prime means a certain sum of elements E tensor E prime. S of F tensor F prime means a certain sum of elements S of F tensor S of tensor F prime. That turns out to be the inverse of the E tensor E prime. You apply S to the first tensor factor. We'll see why in a moment, but that defines the Hopf algebra. The, that defines not a Hopf algebra, but a quantum algebra, which has some, but not all, of the properties of a Hopf algebra. And quantum algebras are a good receptacle for invariance of knots and links in this way. Now, here I've indicated a little bit more about elements of the algebra. I've indicated how this putting a wiggle and a putting the A in the middle of the wiggle performs the antipode on A because when you slide it over, it cancels out. There's another element of the algebra which turns out to be related to something in our category and that's a little flat curl. That corresponds in the quantum algebra to an element G. And that element G is related to the square of the antipode because if you square the antipode and simplify, you get two G's on either side of the element. So that the square of the antipode is equal to GA, G inverse, where it happens just like that diagram that I showed you. Um, if you want to see more about how such algebras exist, you can learn about Hopf algebras 
and the Drinfeld bubble construction and how such algebras indeed exist. And evaluations on those algebras can be performed by traces which fit into closed circular diagrams of this kind. I won't go into that. We end up with a functor from the rotational tangle category to the category of the quantum algebra. Uh, and what happens to the braiding elements in the tangle category is they go to the Yang-Baxter algebraic elements in the algebra, but those have to be twisted by permutation to fit the braiding relations. And that's how it goes. So you find that the standard crossing goes to an E tensor E prime sum with a permutation below it. And the uh, reverse crossing goes to an S of E tensor E prime sum with a virtual crossing above it. You'll notice that if you plug those two into one another, the virtual crossings cancel, and then you're looking at the inversing relation between the algebraic Yang-Baxter element and its inverse. You can do other calculations, like I've indicated what happens to a classical curl here. Now, well, let's slow down for a moment. Here is the inverse type braiding crossing. And I have done a topological move on it by uh, pulling it a little bit so that it has a maximum on one side and a minimum on the other, and a standard crossing in the middle. So you can think of this as a swing move will take you back to the standard one after you cancel the maximum and the minimum. Now apply the functor in the standard way to the one there. And you see you put the E tensor E prime in a virtual crossing sitting there in the middle. But now you look at what happened, straightening it a little bit, and you see that it's equivalent to having the virtual crossing up above and a wiggle with the E in the middle of the wiggle on the left. And that's the antipode applied to the E. And so this is the same as antipode applied to E, tensor E prime, summed on that, and the virtual crossing above. And that's what we said was the inverse. And that's what had better be the inverse because after all, that crossing is the inverse of the other crossing. So you see that asking this functor to work tells you that you needed to be in a quantum algebra. So the quantum algebra is kind of the minimum sort of non-commutative algebra that you can image onto link diagrams to get invariance. You need a Yang-Baxter element because you need, you need a Yang-Baxter invariance. You need a third randomized to move invariance. You need an antipode in order to talk about what happens with the maxima and minima on the algebra in relation to it. So the structure of the inverse of the Yang-Baxter element is implied by the structure of the category of the quantum algebra. And we obtain a class of quantum invariants that we can analyze from on high, as it were, just thinking about the structure of the algebra. Now, when you apply it to a given knot, you will get um, a diagram which is decorated with algebra, like I've shown you here. And remember that E tensor E prime really means that you're summing over E and E prime. You don't really need the line between them. And you can move things around and they get antipodes applied to them. So you can, um, and you can simplify by using virtual detour moves. And so I go by F to this diagram and then you see I have two virtual moves in a, a two virtual crossings in a row. I simplify by that. And then I push the algebra around into a local place, but antipodes get applied to it. And I end up in the end with um, some algebra on a curl of, and I like to normalize it, of Whitney degree zero, uh, a loop of Whitney degree zero. And then one applies the trace function, if one has one, to that algebra that is now living there. And that allows you to get the invariant. Or one takes the algebraic equivalence class of that algebra product, sum of products, up to cyclic permutation. That's this version of quantum algebra valued quantum link invariants. Now, can they, is it possible that they will see more than what we saw with the bracket? Well, we can try it out on some things. Here's a 
here's a rotational virtual link. And I've decorated it. And I don't draw the lines anymore. I just remember that E's and E primes are tied up with one another. If you're summing, you're summing on the E and the E prime, like the summing on EI, E lower I, E upper I, like that in a sum. So I can pull them apart and I can move those elements around and then slide them back together and see what I have. And I don't have anything that obviously cancels. That E tensor E prime, and then I have an S bar F, which is S inverse times F, F prime. It's not S F, F prime. And so if you instantiate this into algebra, you're going to find out that it's getting detected. If this were to cancel completely, then it would be no different from two unknotted loops. So that's the question. Maybe some other examples will do that. They'll be equivalent to unknotted loops. And that in fact is the case. Here we go. Here's L4. And L4, when you decorate it and, and pull it apart and, and rewrite the algebra a little bit and put it back together and see what you've got, why the elements that you have are, uh, are, are F tensor F prime and S of E tensor E prime. And those are the inverses to one another. So they vanish. And you end up with two loops that are, uh, that are bare of any algebra. Um, and those loops can be pulled apart. So this, that means that this invariant, this general form of an invariant for any quantum algebra or any Hopf algebra that you care to put in there will not be able to see this link. This link is invisible to such invariants. And so we have an example here from our lexicon at the earlier part of the talk of an non-trivial rotational virtual link with trivial quantum invariants. No matter what of a very large range of, of algebras you choose, it will not be visible. Um, and on the other hand, we have detected it using our rotational parity bracket. So, that's the story uh, that we're playing um, this, this um, um, game of uh, comparing how well quantum invariants can see rotational virtuals and how well certain combinatorial extensions of quantum invariants, because after all, the bracket is a quantum invariant, can see. And we have discovered that there are places where quantum invariants cannot see and the combinatorial invariants can see. So we find simple examples of non-trivial virtual rotational links not detectable by any quantum algebraic invariants, but detectable by things like parity bracket. This leads to many new questions and the prospect of using rotational virtual links as a testing category for the strength and properties of quantum invariants. There's much more to be done with this project, and I hope you've enjoyed hearing about some of the beginnings of it. I'll stop now.